The largest plane to ever land on an aircraft carrier shouldn't have fit, let alone flown a perfect landing. In 1963, the US Navy set its sights on the impossible. Could Arm 1, 132-foot span KC-130F Hercules, an aircraft designed for runways, not rolling decks, touch down on the USS Forrestal and deliver what every carrier urgently needed but no other aircraft could provide. The math was outrageous. A plane nine times heavier than the C-1 Trader, with wings hanging 15 feet from disaster on either side. Yet while experts called it a prank, the Navy meant business. And if they failed, entire carrier groups could remain stranded out of supplies in hostile waters. How did this flying giant defy aviation logic? And why did this stunning victory vanish as quickly as it began? Carrier strike groups in the early 1960s faced a logistics wall. The C-1 Trader, the Navy's workhorse for onboard delivery, could haul 8,500 pounds of cargo, barely enough for a pair of jet engines, a handful of mailbags, or a dozen passengers. Its range, capped at 300 miles, forced carriers to linger near shore or rely on risky aerial refueling just to keep basic supplies flowing. In the Cold War's far-flung theaters, these limits grew sharper. Atlantic deployments stretched over 500 miles from the nearest friendly base. Mediterranean patrols demanded days at sea, with resupply flights often falling short of what was needed. Spare parts piled up on land while jet squadrons waited at sea. The gap between what the fleet required and what the C-1 could deliver widened with every new mission. By 1963, the numbers told a blunt story. Carrier groups needed a delivery aircraft that could fly farther, lift three times the cargo, and keep pace with the demands of a global navy. Lockheed's engineering office received the request in a single unadorned memo. Could a 132-foot wingspan Hercules actually fit, land, and take off from a carrier deck just 250 feet wide and 1,017 feet long? The numbers looked like a dare. The C-130's wings would stretch more than halfway across the Forrestal's beam, leaving a margin thinner than a city bus on either side. Some engineers suspected a prank, half expecting a punchline buried in the calculations. But the math refused to laugh. Slide rules and graph paper filled with approach speeds, stopping distances, and deck clearance. The carrier's angled deck offered just enough space, on paper. A single miscalculation could turn an experiment into a disaster. Internal notes captured the mood, a blend of skepticism and stubborn resolve. The Hercules was never designed for this kind of precision, yet the figures kept passing each test. By the time the last decimal landed, the proposal stood. A four-engine cargo giant would attempt what no one else had dared. The KC-130F Hercules carried the DNA of a workhorse. Its first flight in 1954 set the pattern, a four-engine turboprop, broad-shouldered and unflinching, designed to haul fuel, freight, or marines across oceans. By 1960, the Navy's own KC-130F variant entered service, fitted with dual refueling pods and a cargo hold that could swallow 3,600 gallons of fuel or a full load of troops. At 132 feet across, its wings dwarfed most runways and demanded respect from every ground crew. The aircraft's operational weight for the carrier trials ranged from 85,000 to 121,000 pounds, a figure that made even hardened deck officers pause. USS Forrestal, meanwhile, stood as the Navy's first supercarrier, an angled deck stretching over 1,000 feet, powered by steam catapults and built to launch the heaviest jets of its day. Commissioned in 1955, it carried the Balkan muscle to match the Hercules' ambition. The deck's steel expanse, 250 feet wide at its broadest, offered just enough real estate for the experiment. Together, the KC-130F and Forrestal formed a partnership of extremes, one built for endurance, the other for raw capacity. The question was never about power, it was about precision, and whether these giants could dance on a knife edge of steel and wind. Lieutenant James H. Flatley III led the crew that would test the limits of both man 
and machine. At his side, Lieutenant Commander W. W. Stovall managed the controls as co-pilot, while E. F. Brennan monitored every needle and dial as flight engineer. Lockheed's own Ted H. Limmer Jr., a test pilot with a steady hand, brought the manufacturer's expertise to the cockpit. Their training was brief by any standard, just one four-hour familiarization run at sea, followed by 100 simulated carrier landings on shore. Each practice run drilled the team in the split-second timing and discipline that a real deck would demand. The Hercules itself received only the most surgical changes, a smaller nose gear opening to fit the deck, anti-skid brakes tuned for steel, and the refueling pods stripped away to clear the wings. No tail hook was added. The arresting wires, so vital for fighters, were pulled from Forrestal's deck. What remained was a test of skill, nerve, and trust in the numbers. Wind battered the Forrestal's deck with a force that few pilots ever faced. Gusts reached 40 to 60 knots, driving sheets of spray across the steel and pushing the ship's bow into rolling, unpredictable arcs. The carrier itself made 10 knots into the headwind, clawing for every extra bit of airflow to shorten the landing roll. On the bridge, officers tracked every shift in the weather, relaying updates to the flight crew as the sea heaved beneath them. 30-foot swells lifted and dropped the deck in a slow, relentless rhythm. For the pilots, the challenge was timing each approach to the rare moment when the deck leveled out. Too early, and the Hercules would meet a rising ramp. Too late, and the stern could fall away mid-flare. The landing signal officer stood exposed at the edge, arms raised against the gale, his voice crackling in the headsets. Every pass demanded a new calculation. A fresh read on wind, motion, and the split-second window when steel and sky held steady. Flatly eased the Hercules down the glide slope, the deck pitching and rolling beneath him. The first touchdown sent a jolt through the airframe, but the landing gear held and the engine surged for immediate takeoff. Nineteen touch-and-goes followed, each one a test of nerve and timing. Forty-two approaches were needed. Waves and wind forced repeated go-arounds, with the aircraft sometimes hanging in the air while the deck heaved out of reach. On the fuselage, a hand-painted slogan shouted the impossible, Look ma, no hook. Deck crew watched in a mix of awe and disbelief as the 85,000-pound giant settled, rolled, and clawed back into the sky again and again. Each pass drew a crowd at the rails, some cheering, some clutching clipboards, all straining to believe what they were seeing. By day's end, the team had proven the impossible could be repeated, not just survived. The mood on deck shifted from tension to exhilaration, but the real test, bringing the Hercules to a full stop, still waited ahead. Dawn broke over the North Atlantic, 500 miles from Boston, as Forrestal steamed through icy swells. Flatley and his crew faced the true measure of the Hercules. No more touch-and-goes, just full-stop landings, each one final, each one demanding absolute precision. The deck braced for impact as the first approach ended with the C-130 settling onto steel, brakes and reverse thrust, fighting momentum. Twenty-one times, the aircraft came to a halt, sometimes at its lightest, sometimes loaded to 121,000 pounds. Ten more times, they lifted off again, testing the limits of weight and wind. Each landing required the ship and plane to move in perfect concert, a choreography of force and timing set against the cold, endless sea. Performance on the deck came down to numbers that defied belief. At 85,000 pounds, the Hercules touched down and stopped in just 270 feet, less than the length of a city block. That figure included the time it took for Flatley to throw the propellers into reverse pitch, the blades clawing air forward to drag the giant to a halt. With the aircraft loaded to its maximum test weight of 121,000 pounds, the stopping distance stretched but still fell within 460 feet, leaving the nose barely halfway up the Forrestal's angled deck. Takeoff at full weight demanded 745 feet, engines at maximum, 
the deck and wind combining to give the plane just enough lift. At the closest point, the wingtips cleared the carrier's island by only 15 feet. Every foot mattered. Timing, precision, and raw nerve stood between success and disaster. The data left no room for doubt. The largest plane ever to land on a carrier had done so with margins measured in heartbeats and inches. In November 1963, the KC-130F Hercules completed 21 full-stop landings and 10 touch-and-goes on the USS Forrestal, proving that a 132-foot wingspan transport could operate from a 1,017-foot flight deck. The test required minimal aircraft modifications and relied on skilled piloting, including reverse pitch propeller braking for a stopping distance as short as 270 feet. While these trials answered whether a giant cargo plane could fly from a carrier, official records do not reveal every internal evaluation or discussion about the risks. The project demonstrated the limits of carrier aviation, but practical barriers like elevator size and tight margins meant the Navy turned instead to the C-2 Greyhound for routine delivery needs. Today, the KC-130F's record on Forrestal stands unmatched, a documented reminder of the extraordinary challenges and ingenuity that shaped naval aviation. No larger aircraft has repeated the feat.